Hi. Yeah, we're going to talk about alarms today. Um, does anybody hate their alarm sound? Yeah. Does anybody... Um, how many people... Let me put that a different way. Does anybody like their calendar reminder sound? Okay. Yeah, I'm not surprised to hear that. Um, so, we have a lot of work to do, right? There's a lot of potential. Um, we're going to talk about alarming audio and annoying audio. Um, and we're going to talk about the alarm-based paradigm, which is sort of the traditional way that sound design for products have been done, has been done. Um, but first, let's just kind of set it up. Um, I love this motto, and I've been thinking about what it means to me as a sensory designer. To me, it means that experience is less about the big moments and more about the many small ones less about the big sounds and more about the many quiet ones. And that experience isn't abstract or something outside of us, but primarily something we feel inside. And we don't just experience through a single sense, but inside ourselves it's everywhere too, right? With our whole body and our mind. So that idea that experience is everywhere um, will resonate really strongly with, with the ideas I want to share with you today. I'm going to talk about how to shift the way we think about sound design and how to approach sound design in a sensory design framework. Uh, the process combines art and science, and my hope is that it will inspire you to listen differently to the digital world and to the real world, and ultimately to create better digital experiences. So I want to frame the discussion by talking about the idea of sensory disruption. I know, sorry to be a downer. This quote is from Albert Shum, uh, one of my sensory design mentors, and I'm going to read it to you now. We're distracted, depressed, and overwhelmed. The digital experiences that were once fun, delightful, and helpful now feel like a burden, an always-on state that we hope to escape. And alarms are a big part of that, right? <laughs> from an audio point of view. Um, so let's explore this statement from a, a sensory design perspective. If we want to dig into it a little more, we can say that our sensory experience of the digital world is out of balance. It's out of whack. And it's making us less happy and less healthy. We know that digital technology is a source of cultural disruption but it's also a source of sensory disruption. We feel it in our bodies. The digital age is first and foremost a visual age. We experience it through the eye. And our screens deliver an unrelenting stream of information, feeding us quick hits of visual energy while our other senses are ignored. So working alone, the eye is limited almost exclusively to the surface of things. The digital world has a lot to see, but without deeper sensory engagement, there's much less to feel, both physically and emotionally. But the world is not a flat screen. <laughs> we are designed for a richer existence. Our brains and bodies are hungry for different kinds of information and for layered multisensory experience. But in the digital world, we still address them almost exclusively through the single visual channel. And this sensory imbalance contributes to emotional imbalance, which means we feel even more distracted, depressed, and overwhelmed. This is going to get less of a downer really fast. I'm sorry. Uh, we can begin to heal this disparity by embracing a more holistic approach to designing for the senses and sound is a powerful and flexible sensory element at the heart of a more holistic design strategy. But first, we need to shift the way we think about sound. Our design approach has its roots in the physical and the psychological properties of sound. As physical energy, sound is vibration that travels through the air, and it's part of a spectrum of vibration that we feel in here, not just with our ears, but with our bodies, bones, skin, 
we're mostly water, so we resonate pretty well, actually. As psychological energy, sound is also a carrier of emotion and meaning, and it interacts with memory. The vibrations of sound penetrate the body, and because of that unique characteristic, they play a special role in connecting the physical and the psychological dimensions. They connect the outer physical world with our inner emotional world. And in the same way, sound connects our physical design language and our emotional design language. And I know this can seem abstract, especially when you're hearing it for the first time,、um, but our experience of sound is primal and intuitive. We're not aware of it because we don't need to be. Our brains handle it, they process it quickly and unconsciously. In a digital world dominated by vision, we're always in our heads. So understanding sound as physical and emotional energy. Helps us create digital experiences that are more grounded in the body and the heart. So, these ideas are the foundation of everything that we're doing right now in our sound and sensory design program. And I was thinking with my team about how to best communicate them.、Uh, we wanted to do something special for this year's UX Salon, so we decided to make a very short, almost silent film. So, when we made that, I had no idea that the sound in this theater was going to be like so amazingly rumbly and low frequencies. Like, maybe it's just because I'm standing on the stage, but I could actually feel those drums and the low frequencies、um, as touch. So,、um, that's kind of an interesting, interesting bonus. So, a more holistic approach to sound design can help us create digital experiences that are more functional, beautiful, and soulful. And it's not necessarily complicated. If we can shift the way that we think about sound design in the digital world. When sound does occur in the digital world, it's too often an afterthought. Poorly designed sound is an invisible stressor that creates anxiety and, and that disrupts the flow of attention. And you know, we now routinely expect beauty and excellence in visual and hardware design, but we've been conditioned to accept the idea that most of our devices. Just naturally sound kind of annoying. And that makes me sad. So let's talk about the alarm sound paradigm. In the old model, the sounds of our devices are basically all alarms of one kind or another. And for about two decades, this has been the, way,、uh, the primary way of thinking about sound in technology products. In the alarm based model, to be effective, UI sounds need to be heard. And to be heard, They must capture attention.、Uh, this has its roots in the early days of mobile technology when audio capability of devices was, 
was less and when that interaction model made a little more sense. But as the role of digital technology in our lives has become more sophisticated, some of this old school way of thinking about sound design has become the common sense of our sound design discipline. Uh, the focus on attention grabbing has led to a modern soundscape, soundscape filled with apps and devices producing annoying sounds, uh, competing to be noticed against an ever noisier background, and this creates an unpleasant and fragmented soundscape that we might even refer to as dysfunctional. So, this is kind of an interesting quote from the New York Times last year. Bombastic, attention-grabbing, inorganic noises are becoming the norm. Disruptive, sonic alerts trigger Pavlovian feedback. Cacophony, dystopian. As I was reading that, I was just hoping, God, I don't hope they mention any of my sounds. So, noise pollution is a global problem that negatively affects mental and physical health, and now it's expanded into the soundscape of technology. Time and attention are some of our most valuable resources, and the last thing we need is more sounds competing for our attention. So to support the evolution of modern digital experiences, we need an approach based on a deeper understanding of sound and human perception, and on the way people actually feel sound in context. So if you only remember one thing I say today, this is the essence of our, of our approach. Sound is touch. Everything flows from that. Contrary to conventional thinking, the senses are not separate channels. They continually converge and overlap. And we always experience sound as part of a multisensory web of perception. Because we respond to sound more quickly than to other senses, it plays a crucial role in organizing and orchestrating the flow of sensory experience. It shapes what we see, what we touch, and how we feel about it. Understanding sound as sensory experience means we can tap into these intuitive processes as we design. The sensory sound model is less about sound and hearing and more about sound and feeling. It's less about sounds that demand attention and more about sounds that we perceive intuitively as seamlessly integrated with experience. It's less about individual sounds or a series of single, isolated sonic events, and more about the connected soundscape that we're collectively creating. It's less about being the center of attention and more about being in the background, being ambient, moving from the edges, the periphery of attention, to the center and back. In sensory sound design, quiet is beautiful and we design silence. In fact, quieter sounds are often the most effective. As loud sounds fight for attention, they create resistance and distraction. But quiet sounds blend more seamlessly and work, work better from the edges of perception. Beyond its visceral, emotional texture, sound plays an important role in organizing key constellations of sensory experience. And these are important in designing some specific experiences that, that we've uh, done at Microsoft and that I want to share with you now. It involves uh, perception, uh, the, the three constellations, I should say, are perception of tactility and, and texture, our physical and emotional response to language, and our perception of time, sense of place and environment. So, Sensory sound constellation number one. Sound is the new haptic. I have to give credit for this statement to Connor O'Sullivan, the first sensory designer I ever met about 10 years ago at Microsoft. And as luck would have it, he's here today to join us in the panel discussion. So I'm really looking forward to that. But he said, we were, we were working with this idea of tactility and sound, and he said, sound is the new haptic. And that was 10 years ago, but it's taken a long time for me to catch up with it. Um, haptic means having to do with touch. And while haptic feeling involves vibration and touch of objects in direct contact with our body, the vibration of sound is touch from a distance. Touching involves three overlapping sensory channels. 
the tactile, the visual, and the auditory. And these form a connected web. And we're highly skilled at using vibrations and sounds produced by touch to identify texture, contour, and other material properties. We generally don't even have to think about it, we just do it. So each one of these senses can evoke the others. So we can hear touch, tactility, texture, and contour. And sounds can inspire multisensory perceptions and modulate the way digital surfaces feel when we touch them. So as a little example, these digital sounds I'll play for you now were designed to feel especially tactile. And they should evoke some associations for you. Now, they're not paired with any specific gesture or interaction or physical motion of your body. But just to give you an idea of the evocative uh, tactile potential of sound. Getting the right tactile sound for the keyboard input on a tablet or phone is a pretty important part of, um, of sound design in the digital world because it's a real common experience. A single user might trigger these sounds thousands of times a day. And again, it's the quieter sounds that are most important. And for many years, digital keyboard sounds were typically based on the sound of a classic typewriter. And since it was a single sound that repeated very quickly, they usually felt kind of artificial and often quite harsh. We can probably all remember some of these sounds that we heard in the older days of digital. We wanted something less literal and more digital, um, but also something more subtle and natural. So because touch isn't static, we wanted a subtle sense of motion. We thought a lot about how different kinds of touch are translated into sound. For example, the action mechanism of a grand piano is specifically designed to translate many subtle aspects of sound into touch. So that was one of our inspirations. And we also thought about how touch is translated into information and data, which is what's happening when people type. Uh, most telegraphs send patterns of short and long rhythms, which are really patterns of touch. And this one's based on a, a piano keyboard, which we thought was pretty cool. So now my sound might not even work here in a minute, but we're going to go visual and multisensory because you're going to be able to see this. Even if you don't know how to read a spectrogram, you can see that this older sound is relatively static and that this newer one has more motion. And these are only about 30 milliseconds long, about the length of a finger snap. Okay, you get the idea. And actually, you got to hear it soft, which is the more real-world version, and like very, very loud. Um, and actually, when it's loud, you can actually hear some of the motion. And it's, it presents as a little bit of a liquid sound where the overtones are shifting a little bit. So that's what we wanted to do and get more of a, um, uh, a little more motion uh, and, and reality in this tactile system. And we also wanted to make it last, less harsh. So let's go to sensory sound constellation number two. Um, sound as emotional language. We have a physical and emotional response to spoken language. It's a fundamental part of being human. And when we speak, we feel vibration and resonance through our whole body. When we listen to others speak, the voice reveals a lot of information about how they're feeling. Spoken language has musical patterns, melody and rhythm, that express emotional meaning beyond the literal words and help to create a connection. And speech contour is basically equivalent to emotion in a lot of ways. And as it turns out, there are universal patterns of these linguistic contours uh, across cultures and languages, um, these sort of deep primal archetypes, archetypes that we can tap into when we design. And if it's in, as intuitive as I say, I'll just be able to play these and you'll understand exactly what I mean. So here's an idea for... Um, a message sound. New message. Maybe bring that down just a little bit. <laughs> I'm definitely feeling that through my body. Um, so it's the contour and the music of, of the language that I'd like you to listen to. This is French. Nouvelle message. Japanese. Attraché message, Ariel. Russian. Nové послание. And just because this is where we are. Zman letset. So the abstract contour of those is roughly something like this. New message, right? 
here's a sample PC sound based on that, uh, like a laptop. And a mobile sound. So the melodies sound familiar, and you wouldn't necessarily know that they're based on, on these linguistic contours, but they make things a little more intuitive, a little more human, and a little more natural. And even, this, even though the sounds are pretty long, they often feel um, just really natural when they're played in your environment. Um, I'll give you one more quick example. Ready to go? Is this lista? So the contour of that would be something like this. Ready to go. So that's a sample PC sound based on that, and a mobile sound. Ready to go. And actually, those are playing back really fast, so I think we have a sample rate problem, but you get the idea. And we haven't shipped these exact sounds, but all of the Windows 10 sounds that are out there in the real world now have some sort of linguistic underlying contour like this. It gets a little more complicated when you get into uh, tonal languages like Mandarin, but they even work in, in those areas. So this is a universal system. It's intuitive. Everyone's automatically an expert because they're native speakers, and it helps to create a, an emotional connection. And it's just a different way of looking at sound. So the last one I want to share with you is sensory sound constellation number three, orchestrating harmony and the idea of audio ecology, approaching the sounds of the digital world as a connected soundscape and audio ecosystem. We've talked a lot about noise pollution, but how does a healthy audio ecosystem sound? That was pretty immersive. That was a little more immersive than I, than I imagined we'd experience it. Um, but you get to hear all the layers, the, the background, the foreground, and the middle ground. There's actually a lot going on there. It's a very dense uh, information environment. Many streams are being communicated. But they're all harmonized, and there are technical ways that that happens, um, using uh, stratification of pitch um, and, and other, other techniques that we then try to uh, use in designing the Windows soundscape and the Windows 10 sounds. So um, I'll play you some of those sounds now, uh, combined together. And the main things to notice here are the way the sounds bloom from the environment and return back to it, and also the feeling of, of layering and the general harmonious texture. We did have to do these about 900 times each because they were so different from anything we'd ever done before. <laughs> and they uh, represented a, a shift in the way that we were thinking about, about sound design. So I'll leave you with this. Sorry about the volume fluctuations there. We're, we're trying to work together. But I think you get the idea. Should I play that again, or is that good? Again, OK. All right. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about this, me and you. We're going to have a, an audio intervention. No, you know, I was in a restaurant the other night. And I swear, within about 30 minutes, there were 200 text message sounds from the three or four tables around me. No one had turned off their mobile devices. That was a really, really super extreme case. And this was even kind of a quiet restaurant. Um, but it just really hit home to me how, um, how crazy it can get sometimes. 
Um, and you know, a sound here and there that we hear is, is, is not necessarily a big deal. Um, but when those distractions and that resistance gets multiplied by hundreds of times or, or dozens of times a day, um, it's really something to think about. And noise pollution in the digital world is a little different. It's not necessarily about absolute loud volume the same way like when you go outside and hear construction noise or a train. Um, that's obviously um, a harmful sound. These are harmful in another way. They, they trigger our fight or flight response if they're unexpected, even if they're low volume, because that's how we're hardwired. Um, and if they occur at, at a time when you're trying to work, they also steal a little bit of your attention, and that multiplies. So the definition of sound pollution should be a little bit different for, for the digital world, I think. So to wrap it up, Understanding sound as sensory experience can improve the way we listen and the way we design. It can help expand our design palettes to create healthier, more cognitively sustainable digital experiences. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It's more about shifting the way we think about sound. So thanks a lot. If you want to hear more about sensory sound or read more, we're publishing a, a Medium article tomorrow about it. And feel free to reach out to me.